Welcome to the History of European Theatre podcast. My name is Philip and thanks for joining me on this journey through millennia of theatrical history. Episode 38, The Self-Tormentor, Fathers and Sons and Lovers. Last time, I introduced Terence, the slave who became a celebrated dramatist in a short career that was speckled with controversy. Whatever the truth of those accusations about the authorship of his plays, we can set that debate to one side and look at them on their own merits. Of the six plays, I've made a personal selection of the two that I think best represent his work and which also point up some of the differences about his work to the best effect. As I mentioned in the introduction to Terence last time, The Self-Tormentor is his third surviving play and was first produced in 163 or 162 BCE. That dating comes from extant manuscripts, which place it as his third play, but some scholars argue for it to be placed slightly earlier as his second play, with the confusion being around the first abortive attempts to stage the mother-in-law, and whether these were counted in the calculation of the chronology or not. Whatever the exact ordering and reception of the plays, it seems safe to say that this play is from the early part of his career, where Terence was still finding his feet as a dramatist. Having said that, it is nevertheless somewhat experimental. It has the least dramatic action of all his plays, and just about everything depends on the dialogue. He warns us of this in the prologue, and the audience is advised that they will need to concentrate. Some critics go as far as to suggest that this is a play where a young dramatist overstretches his developing abilities. That's certainly a legitimate point of view, but let's find out. As usual, we start with a prologue, and this is the prologue where Terence felt obliged to say that the play was faithfully adapted from Menander. As with his other prologues, he doesn't deny outright the charges levelled against him, the charges that he messed about with the plays too much by inserting sections from others but in this case suggests that there are other greater playwrights who have used the same technique before, and he has merely followed them. But also, it's an appeal to the audience to be open-minded, and come to the play with fresh eyes, and try to appreciate it for what it is, not what others think it should be. The second half of the short prologue is taken up by the actor asking for quiet, and speaking of the difficulties that he has as an ageing actor, keeping up with the more boisterous parts that he's still expected to play. This is Ambivius Turpio, the long-time producer-actor who worked closely with Terence. The play proper starts with the shabbily-dressed Menedemus entering and meeting his neighbour, Cremes. Cremes asks the old man why he still works his own fields, and harder than anyone else he knows, when he could easily buy slaves to do all the hard work for him. Menedemus starts to retell his woes, to which Cremes says he would listen because I'm human, so any human interest is my concern. It's a view typical of the best of Terence's characters who espouse concern for all fellow human beings. Writers with humanist tendencies recognised this humanism in Terence from early on, and this saying in particular caught the Roman imagination. Within a generation after Terence's death, the saying had become a famous and much repeated one. Menedemus's problem is that his son Clinia has fallen in love with a young girl, the daughter of a foreigner from Corinth. The audience presumably had enough knowledge of the form to know that this heritage puts the girl at a disadvantage, not only by being poor, but also as non-Athenian. The suggested marriage was next to impossible. Menedemus found out about the relationship and feels that he took the right course of action by reprimanding his son for his behaviour. But it all ended in a bad argument and Clinia left to join the army in Asia. It's interesting that Asia is particularly mentioned. It means Asia Minor, now Western Turkey, which was known for its wealth and was the go-to destination for young men who hoped to make their fortune while serving. It's made quite clear that he went to serve a king there, so as a mercenary. In the historical context here, these are the kings who were the descendants of the Alexandrian generals who ruled after his death from 323 BCE. They were frequently at war with themselves and other kingdoms, and their requirements for mercenary soldiers was well known. As we later learn, Clinia doesn't return rich, and he's not been away for that long, which feels like a plot point that was deliberately dropped at some point or forgotten about. The arguments and his departure were all three months ago, and upset by the whole business and regretful of his actions, Menedemus sold up, dismissed his servants and moved to the country. He's resolved to work his farm alone. 
This is his penance for the bad way he treated his son, and he's determined to work himself to the edge of death and spend no money so that his son can have it all on his return. Kremis takes a sympathetic view and detects the possibility for goodness in both father and son, saying, I think you have the makings of a considerate father, and he could be an obedient son if he were tactfully handled in the right way. But you've never succeeded in knowing each other well enough, and for the usual reason, a lack of sincerity in your way of life. But the old man will not be persuaded to join the holiday festivities, and he leaves. As Kremers is about to enter his house, his son Clitifo comes out and tells him that he's met an old school friend as he returned from the port. As the family were gathering for the festival of Dionysus, he has asked his friend to come along, and he's in the house now. As it happens, he is Clinia, the son of their neighbour. Kremers wants to see them reunited immediately, but Clitifo puts him off as the son is still unsure about how to deal with the dilemma between his father and his love for the girl. With his own father now inside the house, Clitifo complains about the controls father exert over their sons, and how they wish the young to behave like old men from birth. He wishes that there could be more honesty between fathers and sons, and then, switching subject, complains about his mistress, who costs him a lot and with all her demands for clothes and entertainments. He wishes he had a well-brought-up girl, just like the one Clinia has bagged. As Clinia comes out, he's fretting about where his young lover is. But then they see Dromo and Cyrus, the two household slaves, coming down the road. They've come ahead of the main party, who are loaded down with household goods and dresses. Cyrus explains that they have got ahead of Antiphila, the young lady Clinia is so desirous of, who is travelling in the company of Bacchus, the courtesan and lover of Clitifo. Cyrus explains that the old lady that everyone took to be the young lady's mother is dead, and that Antiphila has been behaving in an exemplary way during Clinia's absence. They report that she's been living in poverty and that she's spent all her time as if in mourning and weaving cloth. This mention of cloth weaving would have signalled her virtue to the Roman audience. Weaving family clothing was an approved activity for a respectable woman in Rome, to the extent that on some tombstones the phrase she worked with wool is all that's needed to express the deceased's good character. Clinia is overjoyed, but Clitifo is less pleased to hear that his mistress Bacchus is also coming with them, knowing that his father will disapprove. Cyrus says that he has a plan to enable both men to have their chosen women. Antiphila will pose as a servant to Bacchus, and Clinia will pretend that Bacchus is his mistress. Both men are dubious, but their desires are strong, and in the end, they're persuaded by the slave, who assures them that Bacchus has been well primed for her role. As the ladies arrive with a big entourage of goods, possessions and servants, Clitifo is pushed reluctantly into the house, and Clinia, hidden for the moment, admires Antiphila as Bacchus praises her virtue. They spot each other, and Cyrus hurries them indoors as they embrace. There's a small theatrical surprise here, as the action moves to the next day. More than likely there was a musical interlude at this point to mark the passing of the day, that's an extremely unusual event in Roman comedy, where the action almost always takes place within a day. Quite clearly here, Kremis opens the next scene with a morning greeting. So we can say, the following morning, Kremis resolves to put Menedemus out of his misery, and let him know that his son has returned. As they discuss the matter, it becomes clear that Kremis has been told that Bacchus is Clinia's mistress. Kremis recounts how he is being eaten out of house and home by the party, who demand only the finest food and the best wines. At one point, he comments that if a Persian prince were the lover of Bacchus, he would struggle to keep up with her expenses. He fears for Menedemus's savings if he has to support his son in this lifestyle, and suggests that they let his clever slave work out a plan to resolve this awkward situation. After setting that up with Cyrus, Kremis drags his son from the house after finding him being over-familiar with Bacchus, who he thinks belongs to Clinia. Cyrus sends Clitifo off and sees a way to get two schemes going, both to his benefit. Cyrus tells Kremis that Antiphila has been used as collateral in a loan the old weaveress made to Bacchus, and following her death Bacchus now wants to sell the young woman on to get her money. He suggests that Menedemus should buy the girl as she is a bargain at the price, and she has friends back home who will pay handsomely to get her freed. Kremis thinks it's unlikely that Menedemus will agree to this, but Cyrus mysteriously says that that really doesn't matter. Sestrata, Kremis's wife, enters. 
She has just discovered that Antiphila is in possession of a ring that belonged to her daughter, a daughter who was supposed to be sent away to be exposed at Kremis's command shortly after she was born. It's a nice theatrical moment when she reminds him of these events and he says, great, I know what you did then, you bought it up. Because this is what always happens in Greek plays, so of course the child you thought was dead is in fact alive and well. We can imagine this played with comic expression and I think it illustrates the type of comedy that we have here. Gentle and predictable, but funny in the moment as we can laugh at these silly Greeks and their funny ways. The speech by Kremis that follows tries to suggest that disobeying his order and leaving the child in the care of an unknown woman, which is what his wife actually did, was a worse crime than killing her as he had instructed. Clearly the intention is for him to appear pompous and ridiculous, but this is all okay to laugh at because, again, he's only a Greek. Cyrus realises that this puts his plans in jeopardy. If Antiphila is the daughter of Kremis and Sostrata, then she's eligible for a good marriage, and for him, even worse, as a freeborn woman, she cannot be used as security for a loan. Bacchus can't get her money, nor he his cut. What's more, if it all comes out, he's likely to get a beating for his troubles. He paces around, thinking on a plan that might save the situation. The news has the opposite effect on Clinia, as Antiphila is now revealed as his social equal, and they can abandon the deception and marry. Cyrus agrees, but asks him to maintain the pretense a little longer to save Clitipho from the trouble that revealing Bacchus as his mistress will cause him. Clinia reluctantly agrees to hold off for a day, not realising that Cyrus's only concern is to continue the deception until he's been able to extract the money and get it to Bacchus. He gets Bacchus and her entourage to move from Kremis's house to Menedemus's to help the plan along. And I'm sure at this point there must have been some stage business moving a large number of extraordinary objects and people out of one stage door and into the other. Although the manuscripts lack stage directions, we have descriptions from other plays and entertainments that describe them as extravaganzas, and there's no reason to think that these comedies were any different. That probably means that in their original productions in the mobile stage period, props and extras were less extravagant than they were when they were shown as part of the Ludi Festival or in revivals in the permanent theatres, where lots of props could have been carried across the stage in a seemingly never-ending line for comic effect. Bacchus is called for, but she has wind of the fact that Cyrus's plan may not succeed. He tries to calm her, but she threatens to expose him, so he tells her to go to Menedemus's house, where she can still get her money. Cyrus then puts his latest plan into action, telling Kremes that Clinia has told his father that Bacchus is Clitipho's mistress, and that he will marry Antiphila. So this is telling the truth as if it were a ruse. He suggests that Kremes should play along with this and offer Clinia money for, as a dowry, as well as giving Bacchus money to pay off her loan. Kremes goes to Menedemus, who is in the throes of being reunited with his son at last, and carries out the plan. Kremes tells him that his son is deceiving him and only wishes to marry Antiphila as a means to extract money from Bacchus. Menedemus believes him and agrees to play along while Kremes thinks of a plan to expose him. Playing his part in this ever more complex web, Menedemus agrees to the wedding. Kremes is initially confused when Clinia shows no inclination to go and argue with his father for funds for the wedding, and then the penny drops and he realises that it is he who's been fooled by Cyrus. He's very upset by this and Menedemus takes the opportunity to remind him of the advice he gave out at the start of the play, that he should make his son follow his wishes. Kremis has little money for the dowry, so he asks Menedemus to help him stop the wedding by letting it be known that Kremis is having to sell his estates to pay for the dowry. When he does so, Clitipho is upset, realising that this is his inheritance that is being given away. But his father explains he would rather see his estate sold off and see his son disinherited than see whatever wealth he has go to Bacchus. Menedemus again takes the opportunity to suggest Kremis is treating his son too harshly. But Clitipho agrees to give up Bacchus and marry a respectable girl, saying he prefers a full stomach to passion. Clitipho closes the play by asking his father to forgive Cyrus, as all his schemes did mean that things worked out in the end, to which his father agrees and leads the company off stage, asking the audience for applause. Now, that's a lot to keep up with. The plotting is carefully done and just about hangs together if we accept the extraordinary coincidences that the action depends on, but it's quite difficult to follow when summarised. 
For me, what stands out most in the play is the characters and the way Terence has changed them from the expected norms. Where Plautus had made only small changes to the traditional stock characters to occasionally subvert the expectations of the audience, Terence went more decisively in that direction, the direction of turning those characters into more realistic people. For example, the characters of Kremis and Monedimus are neither the harsh old man stock character or the gentle old man stock character, but have something of both about them as they progress through the play. To start, Kremis seems always convinced of his, the correctness of his actions and makes firm judgments that are very typical of the harsh father character. But as the play moves forward, he is forced into a recognition of just how deluded he is, and he has to re-evaluate his relationship with his own son, and perhaps more significantly, he does that and changes. Monedimus goes through a comparable change as he gradually becomes less melancholic until, in the end, he quite enjoys turning the tables and repeating the advice he had been previously given by Kremers. At times, both display some of the characteristics of the old man stock characters, but never quite fit into one category. For the Roman audience, who'd been exposed only to stock characters in comedies since the earliest Roman plays, this was a big change, and therefore very noticeable to them. The reversal of the positions of Monedimus and Kremers is clever both in rounding off the debate between the fathers and in bringing the play full circle and back to one of its main themes. At the beginning, the heart of the advice Kremers gives to Monedimus is You never showed him how much he meant to you, and he didn't dare trust you as a son should a father. If you'd done this, this argument would never have happened. And at the end, Monedimus is saying to Chermes that he is certainly too hard on this boy, it's quite inhuman the way he torments him. The tensions between the generations, and particularly between fathers and sons, are laid bare in this play, and remained a main theme for Terence throughout his career. As I've mentioned before, what differentiates these characters from earlier versions is that the intentions of both fathers and sons are essentially good. Of all the characters who are not quite what they are expected to be, Cyrus, the clever slave, stands out. Initially, he shows all the traits of the clever slave character, and, as far as the audience are concerned, the orchestrator of the events. From his first entrance ahead of the entourage, we can see he is in control. He is clever, and capable of carrying on with several intrigues at the same time, and able to replan quickly when things go wrong. He's set up like the stock character and uses the language often associated with them. In his planning, he references military terminology such as this business has forced my troops into a narrow ravine when he sees his plans start to fall apart. The intention of this long-standing tradition seems to have been to parody the leaders in Roman society who were often ex-military or still serving generals, people who were proud of their military achievements and referred to those often. But Cyrus' plan ultimately fails, and he only survives the conclusion of the play through the forgiveness of his masters, who themselves have realised what he's up to before his plans come to fruition. So he's not quite the clever slave of earlier comedies, albeit still an enjoyable character, and the audience can enjoy his ever more frantic attempts to make his plans work. The younger characters, Clitipho, Clinia and Antiphila, are perhaps the characters drawn with least interest by Terence. The young couple are romantic and genuine, but are more or less just carriers of that part of the plot. Clitipho is perhaps closest to a traditional stock character as the errant son. His inability to control himself around Bacchus, even though it's only reported, and his comments on his mother's suggestions at prospective brides at the end of the play are some of the funniest out-and-out laughs of the piece. But in terms of characterisation, his mistress Bacchus is of more interest. She fulfils many of the traits of the grasping and greedy prostitute character, but even she has a softer side in her admiration and respect for Antiphila's innocence and virtue. In another earlier play, she would have lost no time in selling the girl to a pimp, and although her intentions are by no means honourable, she is after all party to a plan to ransom the girl for money, she is more roundly drawn than the standard character. It is in characters like this where the idea of Terence as a humanist comes from, and where we can see the beginnings of character and motivation becoming a feature of the dramatist's art. The problem for comedy is, of course, that realistic characters don't provide the most obvious route to humour, and they put greater expectations on the audience reaction. It's easier to laugh at the grotesque than the character that looks a little bit like you or your neighbour. 
In fact, Bacchus doesn't feature in the last portion of the play at all. She doesn't reappear after the move from Menedemus's house with her entourage. Her dismissal by Clitipho is almost perfunctory, and perhaps there was the potential for some comic moments there if she'd been present as the scene expanded. Or did Terence see that handling such a scene in a more realistic way would not lead to comedy? I think there's a bit of a problem where the stock character meets the more realistic one. Looking at that relationship from the other side, Clitipho goes from seeming being unable to live without Bacchus to accepting he should marry properly without a second thought, behaving to his stock character type as the play reaches a good resolution. But it's not in any sense a realistic reaction, and any final meeting between these characters would have been tricky to pitch just right. And there are some other issues with this play. Early on, Kremes leaves the stage to seek out his neighbour, whom he has invited to dinner. The suggestion is that there would have been a short musical interlude here, and Kremes then returns, saying that the neighbour didn't need reminding and is already at his home. But this incident, nor the mysterious neighbour, are ever mentioned again, and they play no part in the plot. Later there's mention of a legal dispute over the boundary of some property, giving Kremes a reason to disappear briefly. But again, this seems quite irrelevant to the play, and there's no apparent reason for Kremis to be absent from the stage at that point. In both cases, this could be the remains of edited scenes that have been carelessly left in during the cutting process, but they're odd omissions for a playwright who's thought of as producing well-crafted plays carefully. The titling of the play seems to be another area where Terence was careless or a bit thoughtless. The self-tormentor of the title is Menedemus, but once the opening scenes are out of the way, the play soon moves away from his inner conflicts and concentrates more on the actions of the other characters. Menander's original probably only had a single plot line, with all the other intricacies added by Terence. This, we suppose, changed the play significantly, so surely a change to a more appropriate title would have been a good idea. Terence's attempts to make his characters and storylines more realistic doesn't mean that he completely abandoned theatricality and metatheatre in his work. You'll remember from the episodes on Plautus that metatheatre, the self-referencing of the act of being in a play by the characters, was a big feature of his work. As you might now expect, the effect is more subtle in Terence, but again, we have to give some credit to the knowledge of the audience. As with some of the very subtle references made to types of people in society or from other countries, the audience would have been keenly attuned to such references, or at least Terence expected them to be. It's possible that he was writing in references just to be appreciated by the elite in his audience, but I don't think that sits well with his generally recognised abilities as crafting a play, and he was aiming towards the general audience, but with high expectations of them. The self-tormentor only has some self-conscious jokes, such as when Clitipho sees his father turn up just as he needed to talk to him and says, Ah, my father, what fortune, just the person I was looking for. Again, we assume a knowing look at the audience makes this ride. But if we're looking for something closer to Plautine metatheatre, we have to go to other plays. The verse comes in the earliest play we have, The Woman from Andros, where Simeo makes several references to the artificiality of the off-stage birth scene. Not only does he comment on how convenient it is that the birth gets started just as he was listening at the door, but as things progress, the midwife calls out her instructions from her on-stage position to the off-stage labouring mother, and he says, She doesn't give the instructions to the mother from the bedside, but chooses to come here and shout them across the street. All it takes is delivery directed to the audience, and they're drawn into an acknowledgement of the artifice. At the end of the later play The Mother-in-Law, the traditional recognition scene ends with Pamphilus breaking the convention by not announcing the discovery to all, and referring to it in the same line. He says, Then we need not say a thing. I don't want this to be like those comedies where everyone ends up knowing the whole truth. In our case, those who should know of these events already do. Let's keep it that way, and keep those who don't need to know in the dark. That line may not just be referring to the characters who need to know, but again, with a nod and a wink to the audience, including them in that group too. In the same play, there's an extended meta-theatrical joke, where Terence subverts the usual role of the slave rushing on to deliver a message. Due to complications of the plot and a ruse that he's agreed to partake in, Pamphilus has to make sure that his slave Davos remains unaware that Pamphilus' wife has given birth. To do this, he sends Davos off on numerous errands. 
Every time he returns on the stage, Pamphilus quickly thinks of another task and sends him off again. In the interim, Pamphilus engages in long soliloquies that impart plot points to the audience. This is exactly the type of reporting that was traditionally done by the out-of-breath slave, and, in this case, he's kept running to prevent him from realising he has important information to impart. To bring the point home, he even says at the end of the play, I seem to have spent the entire day running this way and that. Thus, making the audience aware, in case they'd missed the point, that this role is different from the tried and tested norm of the stock character. The slave has no opportunity to be clever, and so is even denied the heart of the traditional role. The question this leaves is, did the audience really appreciate these subtleties? At one extreme, we have the idea of the audience on the temple steps, listening in and maybe joining late or leaving early, as their day's tasks or other attractions demanded. And at the other, we have the idea of a sophisticated and elite audience that were well-versed not only in Roman drama, but in the Greek classics too. Unfortunately, there are no detailed records of how audience reacted to different plays, apart from the odd anecdote, some of which I've retold in the last few episodes. Perhaps the only judgement we can make is that the relative level of popularity Terence enjoyed in his day suggests that his plays were seen as more difficult than Plautus and others who worked in the less subtle forms. And if it was not for appreciation by the elites and his beautiful use of the language that was to become the lingua franca of medieval Europe, he may just have sunk with little trace like so many of his fellow dramatists from the period. The Self-Tormentor was a popular play throughout antiquity. Cicero, Horace and Seneca all quoted from it at different times, and Varro refers to it, suggesting that it was still in production some 150 years later. The central theme, which Terence gives fairly balanced handling, showing the struggle between fathers and sons probably explains that longevity. We can, after all, still see these tensions today translated into modern forms. As with other Roman plays, extracting humour in a production would be difficult, and probably take some considerable adaptation to make it appeal to as anything more than an academic exercise. And my guess is that we won't be seeing a commercial production any time soon. Next time we move to The Brothers, another play very concerned with the relationship between fathers and sons, but one that also addresses the broader questions of the merits of rival educational policies that were current in Rome at the time, where the strict discipline preferred by the likes of Cato was pitched against the more liberal ideas coming with the rise of Hellenism. So please join me for that, and in the meantime follow us on Twitter or on the Facebook page to join in with the conversations about theatre history and theatre in general. It's a corner of social media where we can avoid all the angst and vitriol that so often pervades and find out fascinating things from like-minded and similarly interested and interesting people. Please support the podcast by signing up for additional audio content at patreon.com where there's a new piece on the life and the works of Cicero or just to say thanks at ko-fi.com. All contributions help to offset the various costs of running the podcast and are gratefully received. And most of all, if you have a moment, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts to help other people find us. I'm told that reviews there really do help, so I'd be grateful if you can make the time to do that. I love four and five star reviews, but whatever rating or comment you wish to leave is always of interest and helps. I look forward to your company next time, but if you have any comments or concerns in the meantime, you can contact me by email at thoetp at gmail.com or via Twitter at thoetp. Mm-hmm.